Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast Season 15, Episode 37. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us this Friday. Steelers Nation getting ready for Week 6 on the road against the Las Vegas Raiders. Hopefully a game that won't end quite as late this time as the last one did. I think Pittsburgh will be safe in that regard. So great show, jam-packed show today. Dave, how you doing? Happy Friday, and I'd like to take a little different course at the start uh, of this show. Uh, Yesterday was World Mental Health Day, and that's a very important uh, day, especially in my world. Uh, I am, of course, mania bipolar. Uh, I battle depression, uh, and I think keeping good mental health, especially in these days and times, is very, very important. So if you're struggling with something or, you know, don't think you have your mentals uh, right where they need to be, talk to somebody, get some help. Uh, You know, I think that's the big thing there. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that. Uh, That was high on my calendar uh, this week, especially with visiting with the doctor again there. So just wanted to make sure I shout that out. And your mental health is important, Alex, and it's important everybody uh, take inventory and address that. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Dave. It's important. I I really am thankful for your candidness and openness about your mental health um, struggles and, and wins. And I think things have been, you know, you, you, you've gotten some good news from the doctor, at least I think recently on all these physical stuff and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing all that and acknowledging that and making sure that stuff is, is heard and spoken out loud. Yeah. Uh, I had a good day yesterday. I, in fact, I'm starting a new medicine today, so we'll see how that goes there, but, uh, it's an important topic. And with that, the Pittsburgh Steelers are also an important topic. So let's start diving in to some of that stuff as they get ready to play the Las Vegas Raiders on Sunday. As you mentioned, we got a great guest uh, that we visited with early this morning. That'll be on the show and Vinny Bonsignor. Uh, but I think at the top, uh, we got some kind of injury report stuff to go over. We do. And these two teams have some fairly lengthy injury reports. Pittsburgh, a lot of rest and more load management, non-pickings related in this case. But uh, Russell Wilson, from, from a positive side of things, has practiced in full on Wednesday and Thursday. So Mike Tomlin had said Tuesday that Wilson would be a full go on Wednesday. Thursday, you would want to see how his body held up on that Wednesday practice. Seems to be okay. I imagine he'll be full on Friday. Again, as always, disclaimer, recording this before the final Injury report comes out Friday afternoon, so he is trending towards full health in terms of the role. We will wait and see. Um, how about Jalen Warren? He's been limited uh, the last two days, and so I know Tomlin called him doubtful during his Tuesday presser, but Warren says he feels like he can play. He's got a chance. Uh, Pat Frymuth, unfortunately, limited yesterday with a calf injury. I- I'm not super alarmed. This, this will happen from, from time to time midweek. We'll see what the Friday status is. Alex Highsmith returning to practice on uh, what was that Thursday? Excuse me. I think I said uh, Friday on Wednesday. Uh, Highsmith overturning uh, limited fashion off the groin injury. So that's good. Not practicing on Thursday for Daryl Patterson with the ankle to Marvin Leal neck. Kim Hayward getting back to back rest days. Nick Herbig hamstring to Monte Casey with the ankle as well. So I can assume that Patterson, Leal, Herbig and Casey won't play in this one. We'll see who goes to IR. I imagine there'll be some roster shuffling there. Wilson, I assume, will be in good health. We'll watch for Warren and Fryer. I mean, they're kind of the two that I'm looking at. Also should mention that Michael Pruitt practiced on a limited fashion uh, during Thursday's practice. Yeah, I have a feeling by later on today, we'll have a, uh, a better sense of guys that certainly won't 
play for sure. Uh, Russell Wilson, the, the topic with him the remainder of the week is can he go full on Friday? Uh, does he end the week without a game status designation? And then when you get into Sunday, will he at least dress as the backup uh, quarterback? It feels like everything's trending toward that direction. Jalen Warren, as you mentioned, after Mike Tomlin, it felt like it was a slam dunk. He's doubtful. Uh, on, on Tuesday, didn't seem like he had a chance to play, but you get two practices into this and then he's limited. And then you hear his comments. It makes you kind of wonder what's going to happen there. I think we might get our biggest key of all, regardless of how Jalen Warren is listed on Friday with what happens on Saturday. Uh, if they elevate Jonathan Ward, uh, from the practice squad on Saturday, that might be a great sign that uh, Jalen Warren's not going to play uh, on Sunday. However, comma, if uh, Ward is not elevated uh, on Saturday, probably a very good sign that Jalen Warren will give it a go in some capacity. Uh, I'm with you. I'm not so worried about Pat Firemuth, but I have said that before in the past and got bitten in the rear end. So I'll, all I will say is Pat Firemuth, uh name will be one that I jump to right away when the Friday injury report comes out. But uh, I think uh, Saturday is going to be a busy day with uh, an elevation or elevations because we could see an outside linebacker or two uh, come off the practice squad. And then will we see, let's say, a guy like DeMarvin Leal go to IR or potentially maybe even Herbig. We'll have to see with that hamstring. So to be continued and there's still a little bit of mystery here overall and will all of the, uh, the biggest mystery I think or, or, or one of the mysteries is will all the roster matriculations and all like that end up with maybe Roman Wilson being able to get his first helmet of the season uh, on Sunday uh, but I the clues will come out more on Saturday. I'm not going to sit here and say this is the week that – because if you look right now, if they don't make any moves, you know, in, in, in any roster moves, there's a very good chance I think Roman Wilson gets a helmet. But if they make a couple of roster moves and make a couple of eleva uh, roster elevations, then we might be sitting here Saturday night wondering, will he or won't, won't Roman Wilson get a helmet? Yeah, it's almost by default because there are so many injuries that could take up the inactive list. They're going to need another receiver to have some depth. That's why they elevated Brandon Johnson last week because Patterson was kind of their quasi backup extra receiver. He's not going to play in this game, so they need to have an actual receiver be as depth. That was Johnson last week. Could he get elevated again? Maybe, but you got other elevation considerations as well. So could that lead Wilson to getting the helmet? We've had this question every single week, and so far each week has been a resounding no. We'll see, but they are going to need an extra receiver uh, as they maneuver to get Johnson a hat last week. It would be a big plot, boy. What a shot in the arm, boy, if they got Jalen Warren uh, back you know, uh, uh, what, what would seem like a little earlier than what we expected to start the week. And they could use that pop in the running game, uh, for sure. So a lot, a lot to look forward to a lot of guessing still though, on Friday morning. And for Wilson, your expectation is that fields will start, or do you think there's still a door open for Wilson to start? Man, it just it feels like they have, have have decided to go into this week with Fields as their most likely starter for obvious reasons. I would I would be surprised if we got to game time and and Russell Wilson was the starter. Not saying that it's impossible though. I mean, he has practiced fully twice and it feels like he's on schedule to do that again. It just it feels like this is and we'll get into this. Uh, this is a big, assuming Justin Fields does start, this is a big, big game for him, uh, mm -hmm. especially with, uh, Russell Wilson returning to full health here. Uh, uh, how as, assuming Fields does start and, and play, play in this game, how he plays, you know, it, it, it feels like it's on a game by game basis with him right now. Yeah, I get that, and I think it, the, I, I agree, I believe, and expect that Fields will start, that Wilson will be the number two and inactive, not have his previous status of inactive emergency uh, emergency third quarterback, um, but they can't play the health card anymore, especially right. if that situation plays out. What I imagine Tomlin would say post-game if he's asked, if, that, if it plays out that way and he'll be asked about it, I'm sure he'll say, 
well, Fields got work with the ones all week. Wilson was working with the twos. We just wanted to stick with Fields because he was working with our our main group there. I think that's going to be the new excuse for at least one week from Tomlin. Uh, assuming Fields is a starter and assuming Russell Wilson is is dressed as the backup quarterback, how would you – what percentage on the probability meter – uh, would you put, we, we talked about this earlier in the week, what would it look like to have Justin Fields yanked from this game uh, in, 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 to put Russell Wilson on the field? Would it take just a slow moving, slow start, or would it have to be multiple turnovers and extremely bad play for, for, for Fields to get yanked? I think more of the latter. But this is also a really important game for Pittsburgh. You do not want to drop three straight and lose this third game here to a Raiders team that you are better than, healthier than, and and should beat. So I don't know if that changes the equation, the sense of urgency in Mike Tomlin's mind. If this team was, say, five and whatever, four and one, whatever the case is, maybe you're a little more patient with it. So I think it would still require more just objectively poor play from fields and harmful play to the team than just kind of flat play from the offense overall but it will be a discussion. You don't like to talk about must-win games uh, with uh, this early in the season, especially with the team having more wins than losses, but uh, we talked about how important it is for this team to rattle off some wins in the first, before their bye week and obviously got a kind of a unique schedule moving forward past this week with some primetime games uh, as you get closer to the bye, but this feels like it might even qualify as like a five or a six on the must win scale, right? It's up there. You don't want to go to three and three, drop three in a row and lose to the Raiders, which has its own gut punch for a team that that you feel like you're a better, more competitive squad then. So we'll see, but it is, um, yeah, you certainly don't want to be sitting here Monday talking about third straight loss. All right. Moving on from the uh, health of the team. To the health of the Raiders, and we'll touch on this more with Benny here in a little bit. Devontae Adams, of course, will not play. I know Max Crosby has been out with the ankle injury. He's going to play. He played last week. They're going to just manage his reps in practice. He's going to be out there. I, As you mentioned with Benny a little bit later, I don't think Michael Mayer, their first-round pick a couple years ago at tight end, will play for a personal reason. The two names I really want to watch are Jackson Powers Johnson, the rookie left guard who Pittsburgh, of course, scouted pretty heavily in the pre jet process. He's got a knee injury, did not practice Thursday, and their running back, Samir White, with a groin. He was inactive in Week 5. want to see if he's going in this one. If not, then it'll be more of a Alexander Madison and uh, Amir Abdullah. All right, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, some, uh, you know, and obviously uh, they lost Christian Wilkins in the middle of that defense. That was a big blow to them this past week on the defensive side of football when it comes to injuries. Yeah, great interior player. He was plugging up the run really well, had a couple of sacks, and so he is uh, on IR, will not play in this game, and could be done for the season. All right, Dave, let's go over to the coordinators. Now Arthur Smith, Terrell Austin, as they always do, speaking to the media on Thursday, we'll start with Terrell Austin. This time was asked about, did you consider blitzing on that fourth down touchdown that Dak Prescott hit Jalen Clover for the game winning score? Austin said he considered it, considers all possibilities, but wanted to get home with his front four. And it kind of extended to the last question that he was asked about saying that you you won't have Herbig and probably won't have Highsmith. And you're obviously hurting an outside linebacker. Will that change your plan? Will you, you, will you have to blitz more and be more aggressive? And Austin essentially said, not really. Our plan's going to be our plan. We trust our guys to get home. Is that lip service? Is that just not him wanting to tell the Raiders, hey, we're going to blitz more this week? We'll see, but I hope the plan is different because you can't have the same plan and just rush your core four when you have Herbig and Highsmith and Watt compared to whenever it's Watt and Moon and Ogundeji and Leota. It's just a, it's not going to work as well, obviously. Sounds like a Sopranos movie, but uh, <laughs> or, or episode, but uh, and, you know they've talked about too. It depends on the quarterback that you're facing, and it looks like the. Uh, uh, are Are you surprised that uh, this is kind of a sidebar here? But you know Antonio Pierce started off the week saying we're going to have a quarterback competition. What I, <laughs> and then he turns around. What not even what twenty four. 36 hours later and says, ah, you know what? We're going to make Aiden o- O'Connell uh, uh, the uh, the starter here. Are you surprised because of the familiarity factor with Minshew? I, uh, long story short, I 
when the moment that he said competition and and kind of wondering who the quarterback was, I, I wondered if it might still end up being Minshew anyway, just for the familiarity aspect of it and, and that kind of thing. Are are you surprised? Did they handle that right? Do you think that they made the right decision? I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about how well they handled it or not. It was quick, but the NFL moves fast and you're practicing Wednesday and you want to have a guy that you can point to and say, hey, this is our guy. You don't want to sit there Friday and still have these guys split reps and not sure who you're going to go with. The team's not sure. I think anytime you say quarterback competition, you bench the quarterback as when she was benched midway through that Denver loss. That's toothpaste that's hard to put back in a tube. So I was kind of expecting more O'Connell, but I didn't really spend a whole lot of time thinking about who, who was going to be their guy. All right, back to the blitzing thing and 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 the, and the quarterback that you're facing. Uh, to me, feels like uh, Aiden O'Connell, especially with uh, the struggles that they've had, you know, throwing the football and not going to have Devontae Adams. Uh, and then you mix in the shape, uh, the health of the edges uh, opposite. T.J. Watt and how they're going to have to probably use a few bo- different bodies uh, throughout the game on that. I I would think you try to get, go after him. Let's. I'll read off the quote from Austin here. He says, "Quote: We still hold to our principles here. If you guys know, we'll pressure, but we also like the four man rush when we get in some situations and let our guys win. So I don't think that's going to change a whole lot. And we'll count on the guys." Uh, we bring up to give us some pressure. We know we have a premier pass rusher on one side and we have a premier pass rusher inside. So we've got to generate some good work from our, the outside guys that are filling in and we'll go from there. Austin has blitzed about 21% of the time this season. That's a, a decade low from our charting. And most of that has been for good reason because the front four was getting home when they were healthy. So we'll see. Maybe more situationally that you blitz. I think there will be some more pressure. I just hope there is some sort of increase because I think just rushing your standard four is not going to get the job done here. Yeah, that, that that that's where I'm in on this as well, too. So I would, uh, especially knowing the usual attention that TJ Watt is going to get on that side, I think, uh, and I mentioned this to Vinny as well, too. I think one matchup to watch is uh, either, you know, we'll see if Jackson Powers Johnson plays or not. But uh, if he does, regardless of who's over there at left guard, uh, Cam Hayward's had a great start to the season. Uh, he very well could end up being an X factor in this. Cam Hayward could. Yeah, I think we need to see more interior collapse from the D lines that they got early in the season against Denver, against Atlanta. Hayward still showed power. He got some work done against Dallas. I thought it was a little quieter. You you had mentioned Benton, and I went back and saw the play. He had a, as you said, a great first win on that first snap against Cooper Beebe, the Cowboy Center. But then it got really quiet after that. And I think one issue is that he's got that go-to move. It is so good, that club over. But once a guy sees it, he starts to sit on that. And Benton's really kind of lacks still that 1B move to his 1A club over. And it makes him a little more, a little less effective throughout the game. So I want to see more from Benton. I want to see a little bit more from Oak and Joby as he was the first couple weeks of the year. Those guys may have to step up even more so than the edge guys because it's really hard to ask a whole lot out of a pretty new guy like Ogan Deji or, or Leota. How do you think uh, Ogan Joby's played so far? I think he was a really hot start to the year. I think he had a really, really good start to the season. I know he's popped up occasionally on the injury report for some injuries and lately more for rest, which I feel like is rest slash he's got some injuries and we're just kind of, you know, he's just kind of hurt and a little banged up right now. So it's been a little bit quieter lately. He had one good gap shoot against Dallas. Uh, I just hope that he can kind of get back to where he was the first three games of the season. All right. What did you think about Terrell Austin's comments about uh, Patrick Queen and Beanie Bishop? Yeah, he still sings Queen's praises. And I know that's irked some Steeler fans who are looking to see some more. I do get the thought. I know we're so focused on splash plays and you, you pay Queen a boatload of money, the highest paid free agent in Steelers history. And so you do want to see splash. That's what you want out of your defense in general. but It's not always going to happen. You know, we're five games in. There's ebbs and flows. Sometimes you get them in bunches. Sometimes you go on uh, some some droughts and some quiet spells. Minka, for example, does not have a pick for last season and a half, essentially. So I don't want to get so hyper-focused on if it's not splash plays, and then it's just not good enough. I mean, I think Queen still has to work on getting off of blocks and tackling, but there is maybe a little too much of a focus on the splash plays. And that seems to be Austin's point, talking about those plays will come. Let's just focus on play and sound. 
fundamental football and the rest will take care of itself. With Beanie, he said bounce back game. It'll be a big one. You can bet the Raiders will go after him, seeing how much Bishop has struggled really the last two weeks, but but was more noticeable, I think, in that Cowboys game. Yeah, he's had a rough couple of weeks. And uh, uh, as we mentioned on that show the other day, <laughs> they only have, what, four corners right now uh, on the 53-man roster. We'll see uh, how the roster matriculation works out the rest of the week. Maybe they... They just don't have a lot of slot options, period. You know, unless you're Thomas Graham. Graham. I mean, Thomas Graham. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they brought him up for what, one game this season, right? Yeah. A Colts game, I think, and played a couple, did not play defensive snap, a couple on special teams. That was it. Right. But I mean, they might not have room to get him up there, mm-hmm. you know. Sure. Uh, sure. So they're, they're, they're limited. So we'll see if Benny Bishop can bounce back. All right. Anything else from Terrell Austin uh, hit your fancy there? And frankly, just to finish up that thought, the Raiders aren't a super 11 personnel heavy team. They're they're 12 personnel, multi-tight tight end heavy, so you'll probably be nickel less, so it's less likely they'll be compelled to bring somebody up like a Thomas Graham. Um, no, that was basically it for, for Austin. All right, what do we got from Art? Talking about George Pickens, and of course, first question that Smith received was about the role for Pickens and why his snaps were reduced and... Smith said this was common. He's done it in the past with Derrick Henry, with A.J. Brown. The guys will rotate and get, get some time off, get some different people in there. So at this point, either you believe the team or you don't. I don't think we're going to change many hearts and minds at this point, but Smith repeating essentially what Mike Tomlin had to say. And you're still dying on that hill, right? You, 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 you're believing what's being spoken. I am planting the flag. I may be one of the few, and I don't do that blindly. I do it based off the data that I pulled and that I wrote about earlier this week. So it's not just blind faith and trust what the coaches have to say. I'm matching it with the data the charting that we do that talks about the splits between 11 personnel versus heavy packages that throughout the season, Pickens has been rotated out in heavy packages. They played every snap 11 personnel. I've said my piece. People can agree to disagree but I, I am buying what the team is selling. All right. What would you like to see? I mean, I want to see him play more. Obviously, I, I think we will see him play more. He's not going to play 60% of the snaps, I don't think, in this game. There'll be you know, probably an increase to his more normal 80%. He's been getting roughly game to game. So, yeah, the more he's out there and hopefully getting him involved early, which I think is the really, really critical part that most people are missing, is that you want to get this guy the ball early to help keep him engaged. That's going to mitigate some of the frustration, some of the effort things. Uh, again, this is not a full throw to defense of George Pickens. There are some issues here to talk about for for sure, but there's also some solutions the team can can come up with to help aid those problems. All right. What else did uh, Arthur Smith have to say? I mean, it was a lot of George Pickens talk here, as you might expect. There wasn't really a whole lot else. He was asked about why Roman Wilson has not gotten a helmet, what he has to do to to get active for the first time. And you know, Smith didn't really give a specific answer, just said keep working and just referenced all the time that he missed in training camp, missing essentially all the training camp in the entire preseason, setting him back. And so that is always important to keep in mind. It's about earning coach's trust. To get a helmet for a rookie, you got to earn the coach's trust. And just when you miss a bunch of time, it, you got to build that trust up. And it's harder to do so in a practice setting compared to a preseason game in stadium setting where there's more, it, it, it's real football and it's easier to, earn some trust that way. So I get the frustration there. We'll see if he gets a half this week because of just the injuries may default him into that, but I can, I still get where the team is coming from. I do as well, but uh, I, I, I can't, couldn't help but think back, uh, back to Martavis Bryant, uh, his rookie season. What did he had like a knee issue early on? And then it seemed like he was over that maybe, or we kept, Seemed like we were in the same spot, like week five, six. Is this the week that Martavis Bryant gets out there? And I think it ended up being like, what was it, week eight or week nine against the Texans or something that he finally got a helmet. And then he had a good game, I think. And everybody's like, oh, why, why weren't you rolling them out there earlier? Those kind of things. Now, obviously, uh, okay. <laughs> The a knee issue is a little bit different than the the ankle injury that Roman went through, but but it if you can't if you can't find a helmet for it and and look I understand he missed all the time and he's a rookie and all like that but I mean at this point now 
especially with what you have and you're rolling out there. Heck, you uh, you you brought Brandon Johnson up last week. Uh, you are obviously not going to have Cordell Patterson for this game to to play that quasi uh, extra wide receiver role. If if not now, <laughs> when you know. Sure, but it's it's still a trust thing. If the trust isn't sure. there, you're not going to get a helmet. But it, he's it, a smart it, kid, right? I mean, he is, but he's he was pretty raw. I thought coming out had to get stronger, sure. had to work on releases. He was not a finished product. I would also say, even if he gets a helmet, and I'm rooting for him to, to get that. I want to see him out there. I you know I'm all for it. But how much is he really going to help this pass game? How many receivers beyond Pickens are catching sure. passes and seeing volumes? Okay, so he gets a helmet, plays eight snaps offensively, one target for nine yards. I mean, it's not it's not going to decide whether or not the Steelers beat the Raiders. Sure, I, I get that, but you got to get him on the field. Yeah, and, and and they will. I mean, he will address at some point, but I, I there is some patience here, and so we'll we'll see how it looks against the Raiders if he dresses or not, and, and we'll go from there. What would you make of Arthur Smith's comment? I'm going to write about this hopefully today, probably tomorrow, but running on third and long, they had a run on, which we didn't get talked about much in the course of this game because so much happened late, but a third and eight run on the opening possession for five yards. They kick a field goal to tie it at three. And Smith was asked about that today and said, sometimes, you know, if it works, it's great. And he was really curious. He'd said, I mean, I'll, I'll um, read the quote here. He says, quote, you also have the factor of if you get it in, which is not special anymore, but if you're fourth and two or less, you get a lot of, go opportunities uh, obviously we did not get what we wanted there's risk in every call maybe that was a little more risk adverse different than the nd one didn't hit the hot and we took the sack fumble which i think was the fields plays talking about there but it sounds like they're playing for fourth and short at this point yeah which isn't great uh overall it felt in the moment it felt like a uh, settle for situation and in so many words he just said if it works fine if it doesn't, fine. Uh, uh, ideally, we would like for it to work. We would have not so much pick up the first down, but get in a situation to give us an opportunity to go for it for uh, on 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 fourth down. Uh, I, I it's hard it's it's hard to sit here and say uh, I like the call and. You know, that's something that that this offense should get used to. It was a curious. It's almost like, well, if it works. It worked. Yeah, I mean, what it speaks to is, I think, the very conservative nature of this offense of, hey, let's win this game 13 to 10. Let's get the field goal. Let's tie the game at three. Let's not worry about trying to go up seven to three. You know, let's not press the press our luck. There was the issue with the Colts game that Smith referenced where they took themselves out of field goal range. And because of that field sack fumble, turned the ball over, too. And so I think maybe there's some scars from that of, hey, let's not screw it up here. We're in range. Let's match three with three points of our own. I'm not a fan of the idea. It is too conservative, but that seems to be where the team is at. And I, I, I pulled the numbers. I was going to work on this even before Smith had said this. This comment came out Thursday. Pittsburgh is about tops in the NFL in third and long runs. I think they have seven or eight this year. That's right around uh, first in football. So it's not just a one-off kind of thing. This thing is happening quite frequently. It was, it was just. It was funny to to see the juxtaposition they took a, a shock play on third and 24 in this game it was incomplete went out of bounds and the, and they ran on third and eight so just very because okay a, a run on third and 24 you get it's it's third and forever just get a couple yards field position all that kind of stuff but they took the shot play on third and 24 they ran on third and eight near the red zone seems backwards to me and look at its core in a in a third and at least not more than 10 yards uh down in 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 you know the lower red zone or in the red zone area there close to the red zone uh that you don't have a lot of trust that your quarterback can make a throw to get you to first down right or will he take a sack or do something so does that speak to a level of still not fully trusting fields to make the smart play and you could say does that signal that they're going to make a change of quarterback once wilson is 100 percent good to go does make you wonder there uh, but it was an interesting response. And I know you probably had your Finch fist clenched uh, writing that post, recapping that. And I'll have my article probably for Saturday that details exactly what Pittsburgh stands in their, their third and long run tendency. Anything else, Martha Smith, Dave? No, but there was another interview that uh, happened with the media yesterday that uh, I think deserves a little time. It was a short one. It was with George Pickens. He did speak. He's required to speak with the media, and he did. Seems to be a bit about a three-minute 
press conference or interview and not a, a lot of questions, not a lot of answers. I would say that Pickens will not be winning the chief award for the best uh, me, uh, player with the, the media this year. So what is your take on what Pickens had to say or really what he didn't say? I was thinking about maybe, and we'll see if I'll have time to do this, write, write a post about this that probably won't, won't be well-received as a whole. Uh, those kind of interviews that, that, that specifically like George gave on Thursday there are better for us uh, getting clicks and, 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 and sensationalizing than they are for, for George Pickens in the manner that he gave it in. Uh, look, uh, you, you can be on both sides of this where you say, well, you know, you, uh, do you want him to give cliches and, and give non answers, but at least, you know, be out there and act like he doesn't overly mind doing the interview, or would you just like to see the real person and the way he is and, uh, and, and just wade through it that way. Uh, I, I immediately, I, it's hard to believe the movie's as old as it is now bull Durham, but you know, there's that scene in there where they're on the bus where, uh, crash Davis is giving uh nuke Lelouch, uh, uh, tips on how to deal with the media. And in so many words, he says, you know, give them the cl cliches. I'm just happy to be here. I'm trying to help the ball club, a uh, good Lord willing, you know, th those kind of things there. Uh, and look, it, it beats him quote unquote, hiding out in the equipment room. And I would have, no, I want, I like hiding. See, this is why I advocate well, for Pickens not speaking to the media. It doesn't go well. Sure. But and and I think he probably would have I, I, somebody prodded him to get out there, whether it be PR department, Mike Tomlin. Uh, he was he was he was he was pushed out there to give that interview yesterday. Sure, well, he's required, right? I think, to speak right. with the media. He'd right. be fined in some capacity if he if he wants. Right. Uh, if you're going to get pushed, okay, uh, okay, I, I get that you're fine with him hiding in the equipment room and not doing any interviews, but the fact of the matter, he has to do these interviews. So if you have mm -hmm. to do them, make, and you don't want people, uh, would, would people, would uh, even us on the site, would we write about, boy, how bland that was, uh, how cliche that was, uh, would we be talking on the podcast? Yeah, you know, he just said, you know, I'm happy to be here, ho hope to help the ball club. Uh, any way I can. Last week was last week. Those kind of things. Yeah, that'd be talked about to some degree. He won't be a story though in 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 media interviews if he doesn't give them anything juicy to write about. Sure, people at first will say, "Hey, he just he's giving us cliches," but it's sooner or later they're not going to go to him because they're not going to get any anything you know, to, uh, to, to, to write about, so to speak, o o over time. Uh, some, some of these guys are obviously better with the media than others. All right. Uh, he's not going to ever be one that's great with the media. It's just that that's the way it is, but, uh, it was kind of flippant overall. And, uh, I, I don't, once again, I think he did us more favors, about something to write about and talk about than he did himself with the way he carried himself in the interview. Sure. sure. It was it wasn't good. If you're a PR background, it's not exactly the way you would tell a player to conduct himself. He was short and he was just, he was a jerk to the media, but I, I will go back to, does this matter when the ball gets kicked off Sunday against the Raiders? Does anyone care about Pickens being a jerk to the media for a couple of minutes and giving some really short answers? No, I, I, I think we're, the problem is that I see with all this is we're amplifying everything about George Pickens. And when you amplify everything, you hear nothing. We need to really talk about what matters and what doesn't. Here's what matters to me, the effort on tape. I went through the tape. There are some issues of effort. And Pittsburgh can't do load management and, and reduce his snap count and him have some loafs out there on tape. You can't do both. That is a problem. It has to be corrected. you got to go hard every snap that you're out there for. The other one, and this was reported from the... Uh, Post Gazette's Ray Fittipaldo is that a source told him that Pickens has been late for work uh, multiple times this year. Now, what does for work exactly mean? Does that mean for meetings or practice? I, I don't know. But if you're late to anything, that is also a problem. So those are the two things that stick out to me. Everything else to me is really just noise. 
and it doesn't really matter. The effort and the timeliness or the tardiness to me matters in terms of how it affects the team. Sure. And like I said, is he ever going to be a media darling or a guy that you go to for that great sound clip other than to criticize the living hell out of it? Probably not. Uh, never going to be in a running for the chief award or anything uh, like that. But I, I think he just uh, he's been around this long enough that he he. He's got to know how certain things are going to be amplified. Not that he probably really gives a living, you know what, about mm-hmm. it. But uh, at its core, know what matters between the white lines matters the most here. And look, you go back, and I, I made this note on Twitter last night. You roll back to that Colts game late, late last season. We were kind of in a similar type situation, talking about effort on 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 blocks and all like that. Uh, highly criticized. I think kind of flip it with the interview that, that followed that week. And then what does he do the following uh, game against the Bengals? Albeit with, you know, base Rudolph comes in there, starts the game, had four catches uh, uh, of a bazillion yards, two touchdowns, and everything swept back under the rug, you know, for, 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 for another week. Would I be surprised for George Pickens to come out and have a six, six catch, uh, 170 yard, two touchdown game against the Raiders. Absolutely not. The kid's extremely talented, but where, what, where are we headed for long term on this? Is this just going to be four, three, four times a year that we're that it becomes highly, highly focused, highly critical of George Pickens until the next big game, and then after that next big game until the next effort. Uh, attitude behavioral thing blows up i mean it just, uh, uh, does this just go back to what i said the other day you just got to find a better way to manage them both on and off the field yeah it's going to be a cycle that's going to relate to a lot of winning and losing it's no surprise these things become stories as they became stories last year against the colts when you lose you lose back-to-back games this year it becomes a story when they win no one really cares about this kind of stuff. So there's, there's a relationship there as well. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. We'll talk about it more in the offseason. I was thinking about it, though. And I, and I know some people probably listen to, to this podcast, the last one, and say, Alex, you're you're a Pickens defender. You're carrying water for George Pickens. And you're they probably think I want to run out of town, you know. Probably. But, A, I would disagree with that. But more to the point, what, I was, what I'm getting at is there is going to be a conversation after the season would this team trade George Pickens? And it sounds crazy right now because there is no other talent. They're not, they're not going to trade him now. They they need George Pickens right now. But in an offseason, we can go out there and acquire talent. I mean, the, the end of the story of every malcontent receiver in Pittsburgh in the Tomlin era, era how has that story ended? Oh, yeah, they're gone. With, with, and with a trade. Right. And, Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant. I'll, 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 look, Claypool, I'll throw it out there right Dante now. Johnson. I, I wrote last year. Uh, sure. around this time that don't buy a George Pickens jersey, right? Uh, right. Uh, now, do I do I think, barring them having a total collapse between now and the trade deadline, uh, that 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 they should or would trade him? No, I don't. Uh, uh, once again, he is a very, I, I can't, I can't stress this point enough. Uh, he is a uber talented, uh, player that mm-hmm. can make plays. Uh, I, I would much rather see him do that in Pittsburgh than I would another, another, uh, another uh, team. Uh, do I want him run out of town? No, but these all, it seems like the way this is trending. And I know, I know the way that you're going here with it. It, it prepare yourself for after this season, for George Pickens to not be on the week one 53 man roster for 2025 period because of the contract situation, because of his attitude to date, only he can start change for, for any of that to change though, it would have to require him being less of a mal malcontent in what, and, and show better effort and be better with the media though. Right. You say you say in a moment it does not matter, but does it matter more in his long term whether or not he stays with what what mm-hmm. matters the most, Alex, when it comes to George Pickens potentially being on this team past 2024? What name me the two biggest things that matter the most? 
Because we know he can play football. Sure. Well, I mean, A, his play obviously is is a factor. And then B, his his locker room presence. If you want to just kind of sum up everything, those are the two things that determine your value. How good of a player you are, how good you are in the locker room. Those are essentially in injuries and health, but but those are the factors that determine any player's worth. But but you say it doesn't matter in the moment that it gets hyped. Is it just uh, what gets you to the next week and gets you the W, and then 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 you worry, then you then you reevaluate after the season? Well, again, it, again. It, it might not matter in the moment. Like, uh, how crucial was that interview on Thursday by George Pickens? Sure. Uh, when it comes to this week, not not. It, it's not. It, it's, it's not, not. yet. Yeah. Now you're saying in totality when you look at a player, and especially when you look at contract commitments. Do we want to resign this guy to huge money? Those things may matter more. But also, again, when I go back to the effort matters, and that's going to play a factor. And, and being late for practice or late for work, that's going to matter. Those things. I, I, there are things that matter about George Pickens, non-talent related, that I think will impact his future standing with the team. I just don't think always oh, terse with the media. That's not going to dictate whether or not you know he remains a Steeler or not. But it would play a part in it. I don't really think so. In terms of media relations, I mean, it would be such I a mean, minor. Not, not not that specifically, but the attitude. Look, some guys, some guys are less flippant than he is, but they just aren't good with the media, right? Yeah. Again, when I say attitude, I mean you can talk about effort can be a reflection of attitude, and and showing up on time is a reflective of, of attitude. So in those respects, it it can be. But him being frustrated on a sideline, throwing his helmet down, him being curse with the media those things to me those aren't weighty factors in, in that but but my point is i'm not advocating for it i'm not even saying i'm not predicting it but i know the story of how each situation has ended with those receivers before with the trade and given like you said pickens contract situation you know will the team decide to to go add some talent to receiver they need to regardless whether or not pickens stays or not and and, and send pickens elsewhere i know that mike tomlin has defended pickens just you know, to the hilt, but Tomlin's mentality is I am all in until I'm all out. And so I would expect Tomlin to, to do this until he or the team decides that we are, are all, all out on this thing. So I'm just, I'm just talking out loud right now about next year in the off season, but those are conversations we'll, uh, we'll be having. Well, I think he could just do himself some favors by not making himself much a target with when he does uh, uh, finally meet the media, you know, sure. Get- Throw, just just throw the cliches out there. Uh, uh, give them something that they they don't enjoy writing about, and they won't write about it. Uh, same with us on the site uh, as well. Uh, speaking of which, what do you think about uh, this? Is a, a quick sidebar. You know, the NFLPA is kind of saying you know uh, uh, player interviews should be done outside outside the locker room and and that way. Uh, where do you fall into the sanctity of the locker room and and I guess the vulnerability of players inside a locker room in today's day and age? I suppose I don't have a super strong stance. I'm not in that position and to consider those things from a media side or player side. But uh, yeah, I, I think the idea of the sanctity of the locker room is a little hoity-toity from the media. I think it's reasonable to to ask and to accommodate a different media session and interview than than the locker room. So yeah, I I, I essentially am okay and in favor of the NFL uh, PA's ask here. Do you think we'll we're we're approaching a point where maybe the media uh, is not allowed in the locker room? However, comma. They have a they're allowed a list of say six or seven players that have to come out into an open room, uh, and each player, if asked, has to give at least one of those such media sessions a week. Do you think we are trending toward that? And then once once that if that happens, how will that change? How? you know, the quality or the, or, or the quantity of things that are delivered. I really don't know. I, I have not spent much time thinking about the solution. Just have a media room, just have a room adjacent to the locker room that is for media and all players must filter through it before they leave. And, and that's how you conduct the interviews. To me, that seems pretty simple. Should every player be made available to the media for at least five minutes to answer questions a week? Sure. I'm I'm good with that. Okay. I am too. 
So anyway, and I will talk about Pickens more. And, and listen, I, I I would love that he get better answers. I mean, clearly it's not it's not helping him. It's only hurting him. And he, listen, you want to be on the media's good side. It's good to be on the media's good side. It's just you know more beneficial in terms of how you get viewed and how how you're covered. So I'm not not liking what Pickens is doing. I'm just trying to say I can't I can't get mad about everything with George Pickens. Otherwise, nothing seems to matter. I want to I want to be selective and talk about what actually truly matters what impacts sure. the team what can be a distraction to the team can hurt the team's efforts and him getting frustrated on the sideline every receiver in football gets frustrated him being angry with the media is it, they just i just don't want to get mad about everything i don't want to have outrage porn about every single thing about george Pickens. i'm not saying we have to be outraged by it and, and yeah, I I'm, you're not but the media is in the in social media and it's just everywhere everything he does is a, is a crisis but i don't think we would be doing our job on this show and and on the site if we don't cover cover it and talk about the actual media sessions and how he handles himself in them i get it but like what's the takeaway from it how does it impact does it impact the game no, but I think it it matters as far as team building and team unity and yada yada. And then it's you, you, obvious. But you can be, you can be a good, you can be a good, yeah, but you can be a good teammate and bad with the media. Marshawn Lynch was not sure. good with the media as a player, and he was a beloved teammate. Sure, I agree with that. I do now, wonder. I do wonder how how he is perceived by some of his teammates, though. Yeah, I'm not saying Pickens is beloved by his team. I, I can't. I, I'm guessing he's not beloved, but. I can't speak to that concretely. I'm just saying there's a separation between media interaction and team interaction, whatever it's worth. And listen, it's some of this mayor speak, but Russell Wilson said, absolutely not. He said Pickens is not a bad teammate. Pat Fryermuth defended him. So, you know, some of that is what, what are you going to say? He's a bad teammate. Like right. you're not going to say that clearly, but for whatever it's worth, just to be thorough, they are defending George Pickens. Uh, you're, you'd be surprised if he's on his team week one of 2025 season, right? I haven't come to that conclusion. I'm just talking about a possibility for next year. Again, as I talk about with a lot of these guys in terms of their status for next year, I'm going to let the season play out. What if Pickens has a great rest of the season and he's just a choir boy and the team wins and he's super productive, then of course he'll be back. And if he's an issue the rest of the season, then he's probably not. But I like to let the whole season play out, have totality of the year before really dialing in predictions. Now that we've spent all that time on him, once again, he's probably going to go out and have uh, six catches for 174 yards, two touchdowns, and people are going to say, see, y'all should have been, uh, y'all want to run him out of town. Why, mm -hmm. why do y'all want to run a player out of town like that? And then there'll be an issue three weeks later, and right. it's a, it's a cycle of life. The system works, Dave. Right, right. All right. This is supposed to be a shorter show. It's going to be a longer show like all of our Friday shows here. All right, Dave, anything else? Any players, any coordinators, coaches you want to talk about? No, no, I think we, we we hit on the bulk of it there. All right, let's get to our weekly interview with a beat writer of the opposing team. And this week is one of our favorites, Vinny Bonsignor. He covers the Raiders for the Las Vegas Review Journal, hosts the In the Huddle uh, podcast on Raider Nation Raider. You can follow him on Twitter, and you should, at Vinny Bon. Senor, that's B-O-N-S-I-G-N-O-R-E. We'll take a pause and come back with Vinny. And welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. It is Friday, and everybody knows what that means. We are pleased to be joined by a beat writer that covers the opposition to break down the upcoming game. Week six, the Pittsburgh Steelers out in Las Vegas once again to take on the Las Vegas Raiders, and it's becoming a thing uh, with these two teams. It seems like they meet in every season right now, and we are pleased to have back on the show the always awesome Vinny Bonsignor. Vinny writes and covers the Raiders for the Las Vegas Review Journal. You can follow Vinny on Twitter slash X. You should already be doing so at Vinny Bonsignor, B-O-N-S-I-G-N-O-R-E. You can read his work. Uh, you can follow him at Review Journal or just go to the website ReviewJournal.com. So with that, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast, Vinny. How are you on this Friday? I'm doing good. We got to figure out why the Raiders and Steelers always play each other. It is, it's the weirdest thing. You know, every time that they play somebody, I do like a little history of, of, uh, of you know, uh, their, their meetings. And there are teams that they just 
they barely play him. It's like it's like every you know ten years or almost feels. This is probably a little sooner than that. Where you look at their at, at the at the career records or the historical records, and it's like they've played twelve times. And it's like how is that even possible? And then you look at the Steelers, and it feels like they've played eleven times in the last five years. It's the weirdest thing. I don't I don't get it. Yeah, you know, the whole rotating schedule thing for starters, and then where teams finish in the division has yeah. led to uh, led to the Steelers playing like the Colts and the Raiders several times recently, and then the Steelers are coming off the Cowboys team, and they only play them like you know because of the rotating schedule once every four years, you know. So that uh, that is different, and then for for the Steelers to be coming out to Las Vegas a couple of times uh, most recently, that's uh, that's interesting as well. Uh, all right, Vinny, let's get after this thing. Uh, the big uh, topic obviously with the Raiders right now uh, off the field is Devontae Adams and you know whether or not they're going to end up moving him sooner rather than, than later in the meantime they're just basically paying him to uh, rehab that hamstring how did this become so I uh, you know I know there was that offseason talk uh, or you know dating back to last year about uh, Devontae Adams but uh, why did you know how, how did this thing kind of feel like it unraveled so quickly? And uh, is this going to get done maybe next week or is it going to be closer to the trade deadline? What are you hearing? Well, um, a couple of things, you know, the Raiders are, are, are drawing a pretty hard line on, on what it is they want in compensation as they should. He's a uh, he's a valuable asset uh, to any team, uh, really. So they're going to want fair value uh, back in return. But if I'm another team, uh, the Steelers, let's just say, um, I'm not going to trade for him until I know that, hey, are you going to be able to play next week? Or is, is the, you know, uh, what's the exact timeline of when you're going to play? Because he is dealing with the hamstring injury. It is a legitimate injury. And why would any team want to pay Devontae Adams for the weeks that he's not going to be able to play? Let the Raiders do that. Let the Raiders pay that, uh, you know, Bill. And then when he's healthy, now let's really talk about um, about trading for him. So. I think that more than anything right now, uh, the compensation and the willingness of a team to uh, to trade for a player that you know is a little bit uncertain in terms of the uh, in terms of a hamstring injury. Not saying that it's going to be a long term thing, but it's long enough where if you're a, a you know a, a team that's interested in trading for him, you don't want to pay him to not play uh, for these next couple of weeks or however much longer it's going to be. So I think that's holding it up. Um, I also think that this could all go away in terms of. Uh, you know, the compensation and the uh, the trickiness of trading an, an injured player if the Raiders just agreed to pay down the salary, kind of like what the Denver Broncos did with Von Miller a couple of years ago when they traded him to the Rams. Remember in the Rams Super Bowl run, they they acquired Von Miller midseason. And the Rams, quite frankly, didn't have the money um, in the budget uh, left over. Uh, the salary cap was, was right up against it. And the, the Broncos said, no, that's fine. We'll pay his salary. Now just give us a second and a third round pick. Uh, for what essentially was a rental, the Rams said, "Done, we'll do it. Let's do that." And uh, and and they ended up getting a player basically for free, other than the second and third round pick, which is uh, serious competition or, or compensation. But they were able to do that because the other team picked up the salary. As of right now, the Raiders uh, don't appear inclined uh, to pick up any of the salary, and I think that's complicating things as well. Because as, as much as fans want to talk about, well, cap space, there's you know any number of teams that have. Uh, the the necessary cap space. I think now it's about eleven million dollars that he's owed for the rest of the season. But there's two totally different things between cap space, which can be managed, which can be you know you can you can move money around or or salary around in order to uh, in order to to create salary cap. But every team has a budget directed by their owner. This is how much cash you have to spend to make this work this year, and most of that cap cash gets spent, quite frankly, uh, during the off season, and so. There's conversations that have to be had with teams that are interested in Devontae Adams going to ownership and saying, hey, by the way, remember how you told me that uh, this was how much money I had to make this work? Yeah. Uh, hey, what do you think about Devontae Adams? I love him. Let you, what do you think about adding him to the team? That'd be great. Uh, it's going to cost about $11 million more. dollars. Um, I told you to get it done in, with this amount of money. Now you're asking me for another $11 million? Um, so those are conversations that are real. As much as fans think that these teams print money, which they kind of do, but the, everyone still does that, has to work within a budget, and I'm sure in Pittsburgh they understand that more than most. Uh, in your heart of hearts, do you think this ends up with him going to the Jets at some point? That would be the team that that you know uh, all along made the most sense. Obviously, the Aaron Rodgers, um, you know, uh, 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 
his presence there. Uh, they want to play with each other uh, again. Remember, they played the, all those years in Green Bay together, had fabulous success. Uh, and you have a, a team that's motivated. Um, you know, I know they're, I think, two and three, just like the Raiders are. But you look at the uh, the, the AFC conference and really the, even their own division, they're right there. So um, it makes a lot of sense with a motivated team to want to add a Devontae Adams. But maybe it's the compensation that's being held up. Um, maybe ownership doesn't want to doesn't want to cough up another 11 million. I don't know. But that does make the most sense from a from a just a straight football um, you know, perspective. It makes a lot of sense. Let's face it, Devontae Adams makes a lot of sense from a football perspective to a lot of teams uh, right now. But but you know, when we when we also bring in the compensation and the money that's involved, uh, that's going to always complicate things a little bit. Before we get into the X and O's here, obviously Devontae Adams is going to miss this game. Uh, the, the Raiders had a, a big loss this past week, and Christian Wilkins going down and then being placed on IR. That's a tough injury on the defensive side of football. Uh, what else is going on with the injury report this week? Obviously, we're recording this on Friday before the final one uh, comes out, but I think Michael Mayer is still kind of uh, dealing with a personal issue. Doesn't seem like he's going to play uh, for them. Max Crosby's missed the last two practices with an ankle. I can't imagine he won't be on the field uh, come uh, come 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 Sunday against the Steelers. He'll be out there. Uh, but uh, Jacoby Myers kind of sticks out there with that ankle injury. Uh, what else is going on with this uh, injury report? Uh, who who do you think has a good chance of being not making the game this week? Yeah, I feel like Max. Um, you know, he's he's in his Clark Kent close right now but come sunday he'll uh, he'll go into the phone booth or wherever superman goes into uh these days to uh switch over to the uh superman cape and he'll, he'll i'm sure he'll be out there uh, on sunday playing through the ankle injury um jacoby i mean we we, we spoke to him earlier this week um he didn't indicate that it was going to be a long-term thing or, or it, it just didn't feel like it was something that was going to keep him out of sunday's game i think there's some some management going on uh with, with him uh, I would expect Jacoby Myers to be out there, but you, as you mentioned, Michael Mayer uh, still dealing with the personal uh, issue. Um, the, the Raiders hope to get him back, you know, fairly soon, but it's not going to be uh, in time for this week. Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson hasn't practiced, uh, you know, uh, didn't practice yesterday on Thursday, so uh, he's dealing with a knee injury. Uh, there's just it's it's like a who's who on that injury list right now, and it's kind of been something that the Raiders have been dealing with. You know, all year long, they've lost Marcus Epps, their starting safety. Malcolm Coots, their starting defensive end, to season-ending injuries. Uh, the uh, the Christian Wilkins injuries appears to be a season-ender. Uh, I think he's going to, you know, want to give it every opportunity he can to, at some point, get on the field. But uh, that's a that's a that Jones fracture is usually that three to four month uh, ordeal. So that doesn't seem like the timeline there works. And of course, Devontae Adams isn't going to be out there. So. It's kind of a mass unit here in Las Vegas. Uh, nobody's making any excuses because you look around the league and there's a lot, a lot of teams that are dealing with, with injuries. The Raiders are one of them. Um, but it, it's certainly for a team that is as young as the Raiders are, um, is as, you know, uh, challenged in terms of their depth as they are. Um, uh, it's just it's 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 difficult for them, you know, to muster it up on, on, on Sundays when they're dealing with that many uh, injuries. It's something that they couldn't have accounted for coming into the season. I felt like they were pretty top heavy uh, with the roster with guys like Christian Wilkins and Max Crosby and Devante. But you start taking a guy here and a guy there and then another one and then another one uh, off this roster, uh, they feel it pretty quickly. Not a lot of phone booths anymore, Vinny. Maybe the Apple Store that Crosby will come out of. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Right. What the exactly. equivalent today Good is. Uh, obviously, the the big change here for the Raiders is quarterback going from Gardner Minshew to Aiden O'Connell. Why did Antonio Pierce make that change? Why is O'Connell the right guy? And for Steeler fans who haven't seen him, a second year player, never played uh, Pittsburgh before, what is the strengths and weaknesses of Aiden O'Connell's game? Yeah, um, it was it was uh, funny because a reporter asked uh, Aiden, you know, uh, what do you think earned you this job? And in my head, I was like, I don't know that Aiden necessarily earned the job. <laughs> more of that. You know, I had nothing against them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, it was it was more that Gardner couldn't hold on to the job, which is kind of, you know, after after naming um, uh, Gardner the starter, uh, you know, and I I watched every throw that he made in training camp and OTAs and mini camp, and between he and Aiden O'Connell, it just neither one of them really stood out very much uh, during that time. So I'm not going to say that Gardner won it by default, but 
they had to pick somebody, right? And and without either one of them kind of taking the bull by the horns uh, during the competition, um, it just when they when they did turn to to, to, to Gardner, I was like, well, um, you know, he's just going to have to. They really is going to just extend into the regular season this competition. Now it's on him to prove in the regular season that that he was to, to justify their selection. He didn't, and that's the bottom line of it. Also, now they're going to turn to Aiden O'Connell. What does he give them that the that that Gardner Minshew uh, maybe doesn't? Um, probably a little bit more arm strength. Uh, the, the the maybe the willingness to stand in the pocket and make make the throws. He's not as mobile as as uh, as Aiden is, or excuse me, as Gardner is. Uh, but then Gardner's mobility, it didn't really make that big of a difference. That was one of the reasons why he got the job coming out of coming out of training camp. But it was it was almost moot. You know, uh, okay, he's got a little bit of mobility, but more than Aiden O'Connell, that's not saying necessarily much because Aiden O'Connell has no mo- mobility. So. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, they're, they're just trying to take care of the ball, the five interceptions and really, I think seven turnovers by Gardner were, were, were troublesome. They want somebody that's going to be able to manage the game a little bit better and certainly take care of the football a little bit better is, is, is Aiden the guy we're going to find out. But even as he said it, you know, this is, he knows that it's a fluid situation and it's going to come down to his performance and, and Antonio Pierce, their head coach, said, look, I'm not looking to make another change, but if we have to make another switch, we'll make another switch. So kind of a dubious vote of confidence there. And, and the, you know, the bottom line of it is, is this, uh, you know, just being straight up, being honest. The Raiders are fighting their time at quarterback. They're trying to make do with what they have. They feel like they have a pretty competitive football team. And if they can get efficient play from their quarterback um and and, and can, can kind of stay away from sheer clear of the of the turnovers yeah. they feel like they could be competitive on on sundays but this, but that, i don't think there's a, they're under any illusions that they're a you know playoff favorite or something that's going to make major noise in the playoffs they understand that they got to adjust their quarterback situation uh, at some point they tried to do this during the offseason they wanted Jaden daniels um Washington clearly was not going to move out of that uh, position and go all the way down to 13 where the Raiders were drafted. So, you know, you hate to say that they're biding their time or spinning their wheels, but the reality is they're just trying to make the best of this situation and quarterbacks going to be, excuse me, at the top of their list uh, come the off season. Sure. That makes sense. I, I was curious about the Luke Getze hire. Didn't have a great time in Chicago. What attracted the Raiders to Getze? And just give me an overview of the identity of this Luke Getze led offense. Yeah. And and I, ironically enough, it looked pretty decent starting Denver, the Denver game on Sunday. They were, they were rolling pretty good and, and uh, using his bag a little bit and spreading the ball around. And the Raiders were real, literally getting ready to take a 17 to three lead. And then <laughs> Gardner throws the pick six to Patrick Sertain that mm-hmm. goes 100 yards for a touchdown. So that was really a demoralizing uh, blow uh, that the Raiders never recovered from. Um, you know, when you look at at Luke Getze, uh, I mean, again, you know, in his in his defense, you know, he's working with this particular quarterback, right? Or these these quarterbacks. The last couple of years, he was working with Justin Fields and. You know, it's funny because Raider fans are like, oh, uh, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers were able to figure out Justin Fields. I'm like, have they really? I mean, I look at some of the statistics and nothing against Justin, but it seems like he's playing okay football, not great football. It feels like the Steelers are winning uh, games because of their defense more than their offense. So, you know, once again, he finds himself in a in a situation where he's challenged by the quarterback player by the level of quarterback play and if you go all the way back to last offseason uh the guy that they hired originally or at least agreed to bring in was cliff kingsbury uh but the minute i think it became apparent to cliff kingsbury that there was no way they were going to be able to really get a a, a Jaden daniels let's say and washington the team that was in line to get Jaden daniels offered him the job it made all the sense in the world to me that he would go there for a young quarterback um and 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 if you're any really, uh, you know, credible offensive coordinator or, or, or hot shot offensive coordinator, let's put it that way, you know, what was really appealing about the Raiders job, knowing kind of their quarterback situation, probably not all that appealing, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Luke's doing the best that he can with what he has to work with. It's one more man down now without Devontae Adams. So uh, again, another another situation where they're, where they're just trying to make uh, the best of it. And I think it's kind of... Um, it's just it's it's hard to judge Luke Getze right now, kind of knowing the level of quarterback play that they're getting from from Aiden and and, and Gardner, and we'll see what Aiden actually provides 
uh, in, a, in, a, in an actual game. We kind of saw it during training camp and OTAs and preseason. It didn't look all that great. We'll see if he's more of a gamer, somebody that's going to, the light's going to turn on when the, when he's out there playing real games, but that remains to be seen. Vinny, when you look at uh, this, this Raiders offense from a running perspective, they're, they're struggling much like the Steelers are. I, I, you know, they, both teams look like they just try to bang their head up against a brick wall until something breaks. The Raiders have had a couple of decent runs in this. I think what's interesting when you look at them on tape is, man, they try to run, I mean, all, nearly everything. You see split zone one week. You see uh, you know, man duo. You see a lot of inside zone. Uh, man, they'll get those uh, wide receivers and even tight ends at times in kind of those short uh, end of rounds. Uh, they run a lot of everything overall, but they don't, you know, uh, uh, jack jack of all trades, kind of master of none. What what do you view as their best kind of run concept that uh, you might see more specifically of this week? Hmm. Trying to figure out if there really is one. Um, and, and what you're describing is, is an offensive coordinator, an offense kind of grasping at straws, trying to figure out something that does work, something that they can hang their, their hat on. And, and, it, and it's really been, um, very elusive trying to find, uh, what that is. And, uh, you know, I, when Zamir White is in there, I think he's more of a power runner than, that, than, the, than that, than that zone. Alexander Madison's, a little bit better at the with with the zone, uh, you know, running. So you know they've got two running backs that do two different things basically, or, or their strengths are are a little bit different. So trying to fit that in, they they their offensive line, um, you know, they they they've really never been able to find stable ground with their offensive line between the injuries and uh, you know uh, it's guys moving around. So it's just been again kind of grasping for straws. Personally, I think they're better at the power game. Uh, but all the offensive linemen said, "No, we like this zone, uh, you know, uh, scheme. It's 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 better suited for our for our you know skill set." But um, that might be true, um, and I'm taking them at their word. But but the reality is, they haven't been able to do any of it very good, and it's, that's really has hurt them. They were they were counting on being able to run the ball to kind of take some pressure off of that quarterback. And you go back to last year when Zamir White took over for Josh Jacobs over the last four games. Uh, the reason why the Raiders had hope that the running game was going to be um, a focal point or, or something that they could hang their hat on was he led the league in rushing the last four games of the season. He was the uh, he was picking up the most yards per carry over those fourth games four four games uh, in the NFL. But none of that has carried over uh, to the regular season. Now he's hurt, and you know Alexander Madison is getting the the bulk of the carries, and he's been maybe a little bit better, uh, but it hasn't been um, you know so much better that it's making a huge difference. One uh, thing they are trying to hang their hat on, especially without Devontae Adams, is Brock Bowers, a very talented uh, player. Boy, they do a lot with him. They move him around. They attach him to the line. They H-back him. They'll motion him, put him in the fullback role and kind of go from there. Uh, 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 they'll split him out. They're doing everything. And it seemed like the Broncos said enough is enough. And I think at one point they had put Patrick Sertain uh, on, on him for a little bit in that game as well, too. Uh, that's the, that's, that's how they're going to move the football. Uh, if they have success, it feels like on Sunday against the Steelers, right? Just try to move, uh, Brock Bowers around, trying to get the football in his hands, uh, as, as much as possible, even if it includes sort of those kind of those short in around, uh, carries out uh, uh, around the end to him. Uh, talk, just talk a little bit about, uh, what you see out of Brock Bowers, uh, how, you know, and how they're using him. Yeah, it's funny because as you were mentioning all the various ways that they that they've utilized him, it took me back to to draft night. You know when the Raiders made that selection, and it was a surprise really to to everyone. But I I know a lot of fans were like, you know, why would you draft a tight end that high? And you know, you just drafted Michael Mayer the year before in the second round, and I'm like, I know he's listed as a tight end, but he's way more than just a tight end. And as 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 you just you know uh, uh, said listing all the ways that they use him this is a just a weapon and kind of an ultimate weapon uh and somebody that i think is just really scratching the surface uh, and you're right <clears throat> he was burned in the, the the denver broncos yesterday and and they put their best defensive secondary player patrick certain on him and even at that there were there were times where he was wide open and and, and gardner just missed him so he's going to be a handful for a lot of teams and uh you know, I, I know Raider Nation kind of looks forward to the day when when he's paired up with a really good quarterback, and that's good. It's 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 going to be scary. That's 
coming at some point as when the Raiders do get their their you know quarterback of the future. Uh, but for right now, again, they're they're trying to make the most of him, which is a lot uh, with the quarterback uh, play that they that they have right now. But that's a player that um, that I think the NFL and and fans, whether you're Raider fans or or fans of anybody else, you're gonna you're gonna appreciate Brock Bowers. He is a heck of a football player. Uh, before I hand it over to Alex, I asked uh, some questions about the defense. Jackson Powers Johnson was a guy that was regarded as one of the better centers uh, in the class. Uh, we did a lot of tape study on him. Uh, the Steelers had interest in him, obviously went a different direction. He lands with the Raiders. They've been using him at left guard. Uh, you look at the film on him, it kind of looks like you know hit and miss with him. I've kind of noticed some things. I think others as well, too, with the pad pad level with him uh he likes he boy yeah he 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 loves diving over piles he likes getting himself on the ground it seems like in every game uh is this a key matchup and and a i saw the play where he got that kind of knee buckled under him and i think he stayed in the game but it's not surprising he's on the injury report i would imagine he's going to be out there uh sunday against the steelers but uh he's going up against a guy like cam hayward and if you stand up straight up against a guy like uh, cam hayward and allow those arms into the chest that could be an issue uh where is he it, do you think he eventually moves to center or is he going to be a guard uh for the raiders moving forward and just talk about his play so far yeah definitely still a possibility of moving to center eventually uh they also believe that uh there's people in the organization who believe that dylan parham's best position is uh is center but right now they've got andre james so dylan and jackson you know are, are at guard you know, when it comes to Jackson, he's just a kid that just needs to get out there and play, you know, and it's been stop, start, start, stop, stop, start, start, stop, you know, with him going all the way back to, to OTAs with the, with the, uh, with the injuries. So, um, you know, there are definitely some things that he needs to uh, polish up, but you figure that he's going to do that. Um, it's just going to take time on task. Uh, unfortunately for him, he hasn't been able to get that consistent time on, on, on task. So, uh, you know, um, and, and until he do that does, there's going to be, there's going to be some spotty play here and there and some fundamentals that he needs to improve on. But eventually I think he's going to turn that corner. You would have fit perfect with the Steelers. Uh, and, and just as he does kind of with the Raiders, both of those, you know, uh, organizations and, you know, iconic tough guy, uh, mentalities along the offensive line. So, so I think he's got a bright future. I don't know if it's going to be at center or guard, but one of those positions, I think you're probably talking about the future all pro player. Uh, he just needs to be able to get on the field and stay on the field in order to, you know, uh, uh, get, or, or make up for what he lost throughout training camp, which there was no training camp for him or OTAs or mini camp. Uh, and he's just kind of going through that process right now. Vinny, going over to defense, give us an update on old friend Robert Spillane. He seems to be the anchor of that defense, has not left the field for a single snap this year, tied for the NFL lead in tackles. How's he, how's he doing? What's his role out there with the Raiders like? Yeah, uh, the Raiders really found themselves uh, a gem. And I, I remember when they signed him, um, you know, I know a lot of fans are like, who? You know, <laughs> and then you, just, you put on the tape and you watched him when he did play. And you're like, oh, okay, this, this guy's pretty interesting. He just always felt to me, and I remember – texting somebody with the Raiders. I was like, this guy feels like his, he's got his best football is, is, a, is ahead of him. And, you know, really through no fault of his own, whether it was in Tennessee or Pittsburgh, he was just playing behind better players. And sometimes that happens uh, in the NFL and, and it's no fault to your own. It doesn't mean you can't play. It's just that maybe money is tied up in somebody that's in front of you or, or, you know, you're just, you're just, that's where you are on the pecking order. And so I felt like watching him in Pittsburgh, uh, there was a chance that the Raiders found kind of a hidden gem, and that's exactly what he's turned out to be. He is a uh, a focal point of that defense, you know, one of the spiritual leaders, uh, both uh, communicative wise and obviously in performance. Um, and and you know, so he's just he's brought a, a lunch pail, hard hat, kind of the kind of the Max Crosby of the linebacker core. Um, and and I'm sure Steeler fans are like, wow, we would love to have him. Uh, back, but that's how it goes sometimes in the NFL. You know, sometimes there's not enough room uh, in the starting lineup for everybody. But, but he's turned out to be a heck of a football player and a great addition uh, by Dave Ziegler, who was the then general manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, happy for his success out there. My last question for you, Vinny. Then I'll let Dave finish things up. 
How do you judge Antonio Pierce? You know, get the job midway through last year. It's a rebuilding roster in some ways. Don't have a quarterback. Competitive AFC West. He's basically now coached a full season over the last two, I think it'll be his 15th career game uh, on, on Sunday. How do you judge him? How do you weigh expectations for this team? Yeah, and, you know, I hate to keep going back to the quarterback, but to me it kind of all starts there. Um, right. You know, um, there are 500, there, there are 500 teams you know, with, with this iteration of quarterbacks right now and going back to last year, that iteration of quarterbacks. Um, and, 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 you know, they, they, they've got, you know, when you're talking about Robert Spillane and Max Crosby and Christian Wilkins and, you know, uh, Jack Jones and, you know, Jacorian Bennett and Nate Hobbs, they've got talent, you know, Brock Bowers and Jacoby Myers and De Devontae when he's uh, out there, Trey Tucker, um, you know, the running backs, they've got talent, but, you know, you can only go, you only go as so far as, as, as your level of quarterback play. And they, and, and when you're on that roller coaster ride of inconsistency, and, you know, I don't know if anyone's shocked at, at Gardner Minshew being kind of up and down, but that's who he's been his entire career. It's why you mm -hmm. guys were able to hold on to a, a starting job. And so you have to live in and, and die with, 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 with that. Uh, when, when it's good, it looks pretty good but it go it gets bad pretty quick and you just and there's nothing i don't know that there's anything that you can expect more uh quite honestly so when it comes to antonio pierce um you know at, at this point he's being judged by by this level of talent and, and that level of quarterback but you go all the way back to i remember talking to him at the scouting combine and he was adamant about how he didn't want any more band-aids at quarterback well there's one thing to not want that but it's an entirely other thing to go get the non band-aid quarterback and the Raiders mm -hmm. were behind a rock in a hard place um you know drafting 13th and part of that was winning some quote-unquote meaningless games at the end of last year you know um uh, which which solidified his spot as the head coach potentially probably uh, but it really did nothing for them in terms of getting the quarterback of the future so um you know that that said uh there's been some mistakes there's been some tactical errors there's been some things that he said that I think he wishes he had back um, you know, and, and that's all a learning curve. And, you know, remember he was a linebacker coach for all of a year and a half in the NFL before becoming a head coach. That's, that's, that's the extent of his NFL coaching experience. So to expect him to have everything down pat, um, when he got that job was unrealistic. He said at the time, you know, I, there's a lot that I have to learn. And certainly <laughs> that's, that's certainly been the case. Uh, but you know, in his defense until they get, you know, a good quarterback, uh, you know, how harshly, um, you know, can you, can you really, can you really grade him? Uh, Vinny, who are the X factors on both sides of the football this week for the Raiders to win this game at home against the Steelers? Yeah, I think, uh, somebody like a Nate Hobbs, um, or a Jack Jones, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, picking one off, um, for the Raiders, uh, over on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, a guy like Trey Tucker, who can, you know, uh, I think there's going to be some favorable matchups for him on the offensive side of the ball. Um, you know, and then I'll go Brock Bowers, not necessarily an X factor, but somebody that can really make an impact in the football game. And how are their special teams? What's your thoughts on the special teams? They got a great kicker over there, uh, obviously. Uh, how, how do you view their special teams through the first five games? Yeah, the kicker and the punter are good. Um, everything else has been a little bit spotty. They're not. Uh, you, if you look at Pro Football Focus, they're they're one of the worst special teams uh, units in the NFL, and that has to go. That goes to their coverage and their return uh, groups. But in terms of the kicker, uh, Daniel Carlson is is uh, is as good as it gets in the NFL, and certainly AJ Cole is one of the best punters in the NFL. Is tackling one of the main issues on defense heading into this game? The worst tackling team in the NFL by proficiency. They've missed 66 tackles, which is the most in the NFL. So that's something that they got to get squared away in a hurry because, because as Patrick Graham, their defensive coordinator, said you got to have a cap tackling game plan against the Steelers. And uh, and and if you don't, you're going to get hurt. And that's the that's a really big worry for the Raiders going into this game. All right, Vinny, you ready for this rock fight? Uh, seems like it might be a low-scoring game here. Uh, just the way Mike Tomlin kind of likes them, it feels like. Uh, what way do you see this going? And if you wouldn't mind, throw out a score prediction for us. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. Uh, I think one team's going to win it 20-17-ish. to 17 -ish. <laughs> I don't know who that team's going to be. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think that uh, you know, you're talking about you're talking about two – 
I, the one thing that I that I think works in the in the, in the Steelers' favor is that that defense for the Raiders is really banged up, and so so maybe they're able to take advantage, kind of like the Denver Broncos did, and especially if if something some kind of calamity hits with the Raiders, they're a super young team. Uh, I don't know that they're uh, 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 you know uh, adequately equipped for some calamity like last week in Denver. So if something along those lines happen. Uh, then the Steelers, you know, they can grab momentum and, and run with it. So uh, I'll leave room for that as well. All right. Tell people what you got going on as far as promotion. I think last time you told us you had something going on down there at uh, Legion Stadium and all. Uh, what, what you know, uh, talk to the Steeler fans about uh, what, you know, what they can expect out of uh, your outfit and uh, tell us about, you know, something to read, uh, a must read over on the site. Yeah, just go to VegasNation.com. Um, you know, uh, uh, that's where uh, all of my uh, stuff is and all my colleague stuff uh, is as well. Um, if you're in town and you want to uh, hang out with some Raider fans and they're always cool, trust me, um, over at uh, the Crust and Rue, it's at uh, Town Square over on Las Vegas Boulevard. It's a great little pizzeria and bar. And, you know, we get together uh, the Saturday nights before home games uh, just to talk NFL football, Raider football, watch some great college games. So, uh, so come check us out starting at five o'clock uh, at the Crust and Rue. Uh, and uh, and and if you're here locally and you're driving around town, go to nine twenty a.m., seven a.m. to ten a.m. Uh, that's where uh, the the morning tailgate show that I'm part of uh, is is broadcast. Benny, you're as awesome as usual, man. Uh, it really is a joy to have you on the podcast and not sure when the next time will be. Who knows? These two teams might uh, link up again. But, uh, man, we appreciate your time. You're great at what you do, and we hope everybody follows Benny. Uh, we'll make sure to put the Twitter link in the post and all and broadcast it uh, out throughout this show today for you to do so. Benny, thanks for being on again with Alex and Dave on the Terrible Podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a great day. And welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. Again, our special thanks to Vinny Bonsignor. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Bonsignor. That's B-O-N-S-I-G-N-O-R-E. Covers the Raiders for the Las Vegas Review Journal and host of the In the Huddle podcast on Raider Nation Radio. Yeah, David, it truly feels like, as he said, we talk to him Every year, but uh, happy to have him as always as a guest on the show. Yeah, and he's a good one as well, too. I know we say that a lot, but uh, super accommodating, a good interview and all like that. Look, a lot of Steeler fans in Vegas this week. If you can, uh, he's easy to pick out. If you uh, look at his avatar on Twitter slash X, uh, if you run into him at any of these events, if you're in town, tell him that you uh, heard him on a terrible podcast. I'm sure he'd get a a kick out of that. But uh, uh, thanks to him for coming on with us again. All right, Dave, let's you and I preview this game. Pittsburgh three and two, the Raiders two and three, the Raiders with a quarterback change, benching Gardner Minshew and starting Aiden O'Connell. He started 10 games last year as a rookie, his first start this year. Talk about him. Talk about what to expect from this Raiders offense. It's hard to talk about what to expect out of him specifically because of the limited kind of overall body of work here. But I mean, I think the quarterback position as a whole, when you talk about the Raiders is one that's uh, been, been, been very questionable. Uh, It certainly has uh, played a part in holding this team back offensively uh, overall. So uh, they're, they, they need, they're going to need better quarterback play out of, uh, uh, O'Connell, uh, this week to make some throws down the field. They have struggled, uh, explosive plays in totality, both on the ground and through the air. I think even if you look at their limited amount of explosive runs or 10 or more, I think like three of those may have been scrambles, uh, within that, uh, offensively as a whole, uh, they, they try to see there's a method of banging their head up against the wall as many different ways that they can, maybe even more so than the Steelers. They use a lot of very, I mean, all teams run all concepts, right? Uh, generally, but boy, they do mix it up and they seem like they, they have games, especially like against Cleveland, uh, their last two against Cleveland and the Broncos were, uh, I think more against the uh, Broncos, they're more man duo type run schemes. Whereas uh, you look at that game against Cleveland, more, uh, more inside zone. Uh, they, they'll get on something and they'll spam it a little bit. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, there's a section of tape where you think, man, does this team run any more? Uh, can they run any more split zone than what they run? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, you see, you know, it's all the next couple of plays looks like man uh, or, or game uh, is all they, all they do is run kind of duo. They try to slam it up between them guards as much as possible. When you talk about more interior runs, uh, I do think though, what stuck out in the selection of games that I, that I watch, and I'm sure you'll agree with this. They are not afraid to put the football in the hand of a non running back yep. uh, specifically short, uh, in the rounds, whether the wide receiver motions into the tighter, kind of an H back, uh, 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 Y position. And then you'll see either out of motion or, 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 or still at the snap, uh, a quick end around. They'll try to garner, uh, the edge that way. They will do that three, four times a game. I would look for that on tape. They will do that with their, uh, tight end with, uh, Brock Bowers as well, too. They're not afraid to put football in his hands, uh, however way they can get to it. Uh, they will run tosses, either crack toss or flat out, just a, a, a toss, try to gain uh, the edge that way. Uh, what else stuck out in the running game? They will motion it. They, they will use a lot of different variances of the heavy package. You'll see two tight ends on the field. You'll see three tight ends on the field. You'll see two tight ends on the field plus an additional tackle. Uh, mm-hmm. out out there as well too. Sometimes you'll see them all stacked to one side and they'll try to bang their head up against it uh, that way. So it's hard to come out and say exactly if they'll be heavy uh, in one. They tried to throw as much mud up on the wall, I think, as possible when it comes to the run, run concepts. And then if they find something that hits, whether it be kind of a, one of those quick inside kind of uh, guard uh, wham, you know, uh, 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 or, 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 or powers, they'll go back to that a couple more times to see if they can hit you again on it. But overall, there have been a couple of nice runs where Madison's got through uh, overall, but they're not a strong running team uh, at their core there they're just uh let's 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 try to throw all this different concepts see if something sticks and if it does uh we'll go after it you know um, uh, multiple times there so that that's kind of my view on the running game which hasn't been great and shame on the Steelers if this Raiders uh uh, Raiders run game gets Mm -hmm. healthy against them that that's that's my that's my takeaway is shame on the Steelers if they get run on in this game yeah, they've been a really inefficient run game. I would say the most inefficient run game uh, of any team in the NFL this year. You look at Samir White, who I don't know if will play in this game or not, but also Madison, the backup. They are last and next to last in run success rate of players with at least I think, 30 carries this year. So I think Madison is 55th and White is 56. And that's why other people get involved in the run game. Trey Tucker, their speedy receiver, that's a threat. First and 10 in Raiders territory, third and goal. He has he's got a rushing touchdown on a reverse this year. It's not too often we talk about tight end run game day, but you mentioned Brock Fowler is a 13-yard run. He did that at Georgia. He got five rushing touchdowns with the Bulldogs, almost 20 career carries. So they're going to get Bowers the ball in every way possible. You got to really be careful for that. So I, I, I'm confident Pittsburgh can stop the base run game, which you said is a lot of split zone and duo. How do you handle kind of some of the ancillary run game of receiver run game of tight end run game, the creative stuff that the Raiders are looking for to jumpstart their rushing attack. That'll be key. I I was impressed with how varied they are within it and how creative they are with some of the motions and all to run, to make things not look necessarily the same. Uh, I think of all the teams so far that I've studied, they, they, that the Steelers have played, they do a better job just in the visual of trying to present all their different run concepts. The problem is, is they're not very good at them uh, where they become more of a jack of all trades and, and master of none. Now, have they broken a uh, One thing that stuck out is almost they, they, these running backs have to uh, – they are they are good of, of of at least getting something out of nothing 
uh, especially, especially Madison. I, I think he's good at, at, at waiting and, and, and fight and making something out of nothing. Now, sometimes it only ends up in a three, three yard run, but, uh, uh, that stuck out to me, but, uh, as, as a whole, they're just not a very good run team. And I brought this up to Vinny as well, too, uh, with, with Jackson powers, Johnson, he stands up right at the line. Uh, they have got to work on lowering his pad level mm-hmm. uh, overall with him. And I think a guy, you could see a guy like Cam Hayward really eat this kid up, I think, both in the run game and in the, uh, in the pass rush game uh, overall. But uh, I, hope, I'm, I hope I'm not eating crow on, on, on Monday here, but uh, they just – as, as much mud as they throw at this thing in, in the run game, they're just not very good at it over. And look, they're missing Michael Mayer, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, a good size blocking uh, tight end. And, and they try to overcompensate with that with multiple tight ends and throwing a, throwing an extra tackle out there. They're just, they're just not an efficient run game. I do want to see what personnel Pittsburgh comes out in this one. I could see a lot of big nickel in this game, which is their three safety package out there to defend because you're going to get a lot of 12 personnel, even with mayor out to use Harrison Bryant a lot as kind of a blocker point of attack kind of guy split zone. He's going to be wide off a ton in this game. They do some interesting motion concepts with that as well. I, I will give them creativity points for that. So when you don't have assuming no Casey in this game, you have Elliot, you have Minka, could see a lot of trail admins in this game, not just in dime packages like he's been used, but could see him out there as a run support kind of guy. I think Pittsburgh will be in that big nickel quite a bit in this game. Sure. Uh, I, I, I would agree. With it. They will, they do, they don't do a lot of RPOs, but uh, they do interesting enough, try to throw out of some RPOs, right? Quick, quick slants. Yeah, we can talk about the pass game now. And one of my first thoughts was, again, the whole pass game with Adams out especially revolves around Brock Bowers and a lot of RPOs where he'll be number three on a bubble. Uh, they ran the first play, I think, against Denver on, a, on an RPO to, to, to Bowers last week in that fashion. So uh, it is about identifying Bowers because he lines up literally everywhere, tight end, off ball, backside, and three-by-one formations. Fullback, they tried to run a fullback wheel to him last week that was there, and Minshew just missed it. So this guy does everything, lines up everywhere. I mean, he is like this classic, like make the whole plane out of Brock Bowers because he is everything to their offense right now. Right. And one thing that stuck out to me in that Denver game, but I don't think they did it much of any at all in the Cleveland game is they'll uh, put him in kind of that uh, 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 H-back role at the end of the line of scrimmage. And then at the snap, he'll almost bubble out and they'll throw screens to him that way to get the football in his hands. Yeah. Or RPOs. Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll bubble him as number three. So he is a tight end NFL leader in targets in receptions and in yards. I know it's not been a banner year for tight ends across the NFL, but he is the most productive tight end in football currently. And he can contest it. Catch down the field. Uh, I think one of those plays that he had to touch down on was kind of what like like a, a post corner or something. And mm-hmm. uh, the ball wasn't thrown great, but he went up over the top and got it, then ended up in the end zone uh, that way. Uh, we cannot be talking about just like even though it went south of what we said last week, uh, 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 don't turn over the football and don't let uh, C.D. Lamb uh, kill you. Well, you know, th- they didn't really do either one of those things and he still lost, but uh, it feels like, you know, he's going to get his – Brock Bowers is going to touch the football a lot in this game. You just cannot let any of those things uh, kill you. you got to let him have his 10 touches in the game, but those things only equal up to like 56 yards. Uh, uh, they they really, and it goes without saying, it's obvious they missed Devontae Adams. You have to make them push the football down the field uh, to, 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 their elig- you know, to their other eligibles. How do you defend Brock Bowers? Scott Brown was asking me last night. It's a great question because when you we talk about a top flight receiver, okay, put Porter on him, shadow, some bracket coverages. And it's hard for me to come up with, okay, have this one guy work on Bowers because he is so multiple in terms of his alignment and usage. I, I brought this up to you uh, 
uh, head of the show here. I almost wonder if we might not see a lot of Minka on him just to try to erase him and then take our ch- take take their chances uh, uh, other ways like that. Uh, but like if he's three by one backside, you put Minka down as a corner. I mean, you can, but there, you know, there's a consequence to right. that potentially. Well, I I think formationally and where he lines up would would, would obviously dictate that. But uh, you know, if he's going to line up outside or whatnot. Uh, you, you got to have a bigger body on him, somebody that can match him. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's gonna it, it's it's gonna be a roulette wheel. You're gonna see multiple people take stabs at him. I think. Uh, heck, you might just play a lot of you know this 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 defense has played a lot of zones so far, right? They might just say, "Heck, let him have his ten catches. We'll tackle all of them at four yards." You know. Yeah, but you get him some soft zones, some yak. I mean, he may find some space for sure. I think you bracket this guy. I think you treat him like a Devontae Adams. And it, and thank God Adams is not playing because we had to deal with Adams and Bowers. It, you get pretty strained and stressed at that point trying to stop those two guys. So I think you honestly treat him like CeeDee Lamb. Like we're going to bracket this guy. We're going to play inside, outside leverage on him. We're going to get hands on him early. I mean, we're going to make life pretty tough on him and make the other guys win. Well, you saw what Denver did to him. They said the heck with this. They put their best corner on him. Yeah, so Dan, so could you see Porter on Bowers? Possible. Yeah, Better man. tackle than Joey Porter. No punch you, outs. Yeah, right. You just can't let this guy kill you. We can't be talking about on Monday. Well, we every, everybody and their brother knew the ball was going to run through Brock Bowers, and they did nothing about it. My last thought here is, can you do some some sim pressures to keep Bowers in? I got a clip in the scouting report of Bowers having the chip. Because the issue, the cat and mouse game of dealing with TJ Watt is you want your tight ends to chip a lot. But when you have teams like, the Raiders that have great tight ends, you want your tight ends to be in the pattern. So do you chip do you, do you have Bowers chip Watt to slow him down, or do you let Bowers go out in the pattern and hope your tackle can win a one-on-one, or do you running back chip and all those kinds of things? So I'm very curious to see how they handle that. The Raiders full slide against overload and sim pressures, and so I think you try to give some aggressive looks that may help compel Bowers to stay in and have to chip TJ Watt and kind of be on the backside of their full uh, slide protections. Uh, I just want to see that cow and mouse game. How does how do the Raiders deal with Watt? Do they want Bowers to have to deal with him? Do they want Bowers to be more receiver? Do they find other ways to deal with TJ Watt? It's going to be a very interesting battle in the way that, you know, the Ravens, how do they handle Mark Andrews with TJ Watt in the past? Again, they're multiple tight end teams, so there's some different ways to go about that, but it's going to be a really interesting chess match. Well, anytime I get Brock Bowers close to TJ Watt and he tries to chip, if, I, if I'm Watt, I try to slow his ass off the line of scrimmage as much as possible. You know, sure, but you also slow yourself off, obviously, right. if you're disrupting Watt, if you're, if you're Watt disrupting Bowers' release. So that is the the back and forth that'll be really interesting, to I think, to watch in this game. Right, and they will, once again, they'll throw a lot of heavier sets over there, and they'll be to to T.J. To, 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 to Watt's side uh, with, with their other tight ends. Bryant, and I guess Schinker's been getting a helmet, right? Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll use him. They'll put an extra offensive lineman, uh, over there as well, too. But, uh, when you talk about their offense, it's, it, it, uh, uh, it goes through him. Yeah, it does. All right. Flipping over to the Raiders defense. It, it's not been a terrible unit. I mean, they've, they had a lot of pressure on them for an offense that has not been highly productive and turning the ball over a ton. The Raiders also, I should know that yeah, the Raiders have, I think the most giveaways in, in football are tied for the most giveaways. So Pittsburgh needs to create some splash this week. Uh, Raiders, they don't create a lot of splash themselves. It, it's a solid group, though. It's it's not a it's not a terrible group. No, but they're going to miss uh, Christian Wilkins in this unit for sure. And yeah. man, if there ever was a week to get the uh, uh, get your inside zone, uh, your inside uh, runs going, uh, this is the week to do it. And as uh, look, you can't let just like you can't let uh, Brock Bowers kill you on the offensive side of football. I think it goes without saying you can't let Max Crosby uh, become a game wrecker in this one uh, with him kind of being banged up as well, too. I'd run at him early. I'd try to get bodies. on. I don't, on, I don't want to run a Max Crosby. I, I, I want to run away from 98. I, I would try to run at him. I'd try to I'd, I'd try to see how 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 he likes having having to deal with bodies and not being able to get after the passer on him. I, I would run at him at least early on, see how he responds right. to it personally. Okay. Uh, but they, they have to, they have to be able to run uh, because the Raiders sometimes will, they'll, they'll, they'll throw that kind of uh, uh, balanced five man front up against you and all. And they'll, they'll let those guys kind of, 
uh, two gap, if you will, and try to keep Robert Bob. The, they want Bob Bob Spillane to have all the tackles, <laughs> and he's uh, getting all the tackles for him. Uh, but you got to find a way to bash this thing up the middle on them. They're not a great tackling team at at really any level, and that includes the line. Uh, and if you can get past Bob Spillane, uh, none of, none of those guys tackle very well overall. So. Uh, even though Spillane is the motor of the middle of that unit, uh, you got to try to run it, run up the gut at him. Yeah, he's got double-digit tackles in every game this season. As you said, and as I have some photos in the report, they run a 5-2 front a lot, even against 11 personnel, where it's going to be five linemen or you know a linebacker rolled up on the line of scrimmage and two off-ball linebackers. And Pittsburgh generally has struggled against those fronts. I want to say Cleveland plays that front a lot, and that was an issue when he played the Browns last year, especially in that, I think, first game, and that, that primetime game. So, you know, with this run game not showing many signs of life and not really getting going, I know the Raiders are without Wilkins, and that is a, a massive loss for them. But that front alone could really kind of slow up this run game and kind of gum up the, the works that could make life tough. So I'm actually concerned about that, even though on paper the Raiders have not had great success stopping the run. And Jenkins is a big body dude, isn't he? Uh, Jenkins. Is, is, Jenkins. Is, is John Jenkins a pretty big dude in the middle? Yeah, I'm trying to. I, I, I always do the scheme reports, so the names are kind of more less familiar. But you got what Adam Butler in there, and um, is Jenkins playing snaps for them too? Uh, I think so. 603, 327 pounds, number 95, I think. Okay, yeah. When I do the tape, I'm they're more nameless gray faces to me sometimes. But uh, how many snaps is he playing? Is he getting some playing time? And I imagine that role will expand. Uh, yeah, he got 38 last week. So yeah, they're a plug. It's a little Dallas. Like you got some some big people in the middle. They don't really go with these small gap shooters. That's become more in vogue in the NFL today. All right, and then try to get those linebackers suck up. The students have not been great with their play action, specifically under under center type stuff. But I don't, you know, you don't go away from it. Uh, you just got to be better at it. Yeah, when they get into their 4-3 front, kind of more their conventional, they one gap when they're in their 5-2, they two gap, generally speaking. And so that's kind of the approach here I'm looking for in this one in terms of how the Raiders will play things. Uh, I'll talk about their pass defense or secondary. Not exactly a ton of household names back here. I'm a big Nate Hobbs fan, though. I think his role maybe has shifted a little bit with some of the injuries to Epps. He's maybe playing a little less slot, playing down near the line of scrimmage, but uh, that dude's a dude. I mean, he's a linebacker, safety kind of hybrid, barely comes off the field. Uh, really good player. Uh, they like to roll out a lot of cover three, a lot of cover one, a lot of middle of the field, uh, safety type stuff, uh, kind of, you know, dare you to work the edges against them, uh, um, uh, you know, more than anything, they, they'd much rather keep things in front of them. Uh, I think between cover three and cover one, they're about 50% as far as those coverages go. They'll mix in, I think, some cover two along with that. They can be beat down the field if you have time uh, and, and, and can, can, can protect overall. But uh, not a, if you can complete some passes at the second level, you might be able to run a little bit because they're just such a poor tackling team uh, in the secondary. Yeah, they've missed, as Vinny said, a bunch of tackles this year. Um, they don't really have a standout at corner. I think they're stronger at safety with with Hobbs and and they had Epps and and Morig as well. They they vary up their coverages quite a bit. Um, I think third down because they blitz a little bit more. They're going to man up and play more cover one. Get a lot of cover six from them, cloud in the boundary. So I see that on tape quite a bit. I just watch out for the blitz in this one. They're a, a heavy second down blitzing team. They really want to send some of their DBs from the field side on second down and so i'd watch for that their, their guys get after it uh they got what troy paul Malu's, what is it his nephew polo polo mao however you say his name and uh and morick back there so watch out for the blitzes on second down would be my my big alert to the steelers what are they uh, as a first down defense uh they're pretty they're a pretty good first down defense aren't they first and I 10 didn't pull the numbers but I, I didn't think the run defense was as bad as the numbers indicated. I thought they were, and again, that was with Wilkins, but I thought they were getting after it. They were doing well in situational football goal line. They stopped the quarterback sneak last week, kind of to do some more play action perimeter stuff to to get through those guys. All right, let's see. I still got the same pull on 
stat head that we talked about how the Steelers have got to be better on first and 10. Uh, the Raiders defense, believe it or not, on first and 10 plays, uh, excluding quarterback kneels and excluding no plays, they are third best in the league, mm. if, if you can believe that, at 4.9 yards per play. So the Steelers have not been great on first and 10 yeah. situations. They're the worst. Let's be, I mean, right. let's be honest. They are the worst in football. Right. You still and, have that? Is that the same tab, or you just have that link? Saved? Oh, it's the same tab, brother. Like you not close? Like, do you not? Do you not shut your computer off each night? No, I don't. You should. That that's bad for your computer's health to not never actually shut it down. Don't tell me how to. <laughs> I will manage my my. How many? You how many tabs? That was my last show that we did. How many tabs do you have open still? I know you have uh, a million of them. One hundred twenty something. How does your my computer Chrome can barely do eight tabs for me? I don't know what you have going on. Do I got you use, a lot of RAM. I do too. I gotta get your computer. We're gonna have to talk after the show. Eat the specs. All right. I I, I have things that I know I'm going to come back to, and in lieu of uh, my my chicken scratch writing it down, sometimes I just leave the tab open because I don't want right. to get back to it. Shut your computer down occasionally. Give that thing a break. Some load management for your computer. It is scheduled for a restart here on I Friday. Not restart. You gotta shut it down. Have an update like, each night. But, all right. Raiders first down. Yeah, that, that's a great stat by you. And Pittsburgh has been so miserable on first down. And so I, I'm worried about Pittsburgh running the ball. Um, I, I don't know if they can do it. Okay. Uh, I, I tell you what I'd like to see is start mixing in some quick slants, get the ball out quick, and see if you can get a guy like George Pickens to run with it. Be nice. But the Raiders D-line, they bat down passes. They got five pass deflections as a D-line. And Justin Fields with his lower arm angle. That, that could be an issue in this one. My last note that I have on, on the Raiders, I think they defend the screen game well. They swarm. The screen game probably would not be my my choice for Pittsburgh. And I think they contain Russian quarterbacks well. I thought they contained Watson well. I thought they contained Bo Nix well. They really don't let these guys freely get out of the pocket too much. And so we'll see how Fields, obviously very mobile, is able to handle that. All right. All right, anything else here? As you said, with Vinny, special teams, very good for them. Carlson and Cole, two of the best at their position. And um, is Tucker doing return work for them? Well, I didn't look at that. I forget if he's, he's the return guy. I don't Now Josh has some special teams notes in there. Should also just mention Jacoby Myers, at receiver, he's no slouch. He had a pretty good game against Pittsburgh last year. I know Adams was the real, real guy that was cooking him. But um, Myers is a is a veteran that's got some size and some some talent. Don't let Max Crosby kill you. Don't let Bob Spillane have all the tackles within four yards of the line of scrimmage. But uh, overall, this might end up being a boring uh, rock fight. A lot of field goals, a lot of punting in this one. Yeah. Uh, Tucker is doing punts. Abdullah, Amir Abdullah, still hanging around the league. He's doing their kicks. Uh, neither have been uh, incredibly effective. Abdullah has been, been decent on, on kick returns. All right. All right, Dave, let's get to our week six picks before we make our Steelers Raiders prediction. All right, let's see here. Let us start. We both uh, are you won. I lost the uh, I had Seattle plus three and a half points. I look back at the history and uh, the series last couple of years and they hadn't been close. They've been lopsided to 49ers uh, favor. And I kind of looked at the numbers and thought, Man, surely the Seattle can keep this. Uh, I I had this going. I had 49ers winning by just a field goal, so I thought I, that extra half point would come in handy. It uh, spoiler, it did not. Uh, uh, you had the 49ers laying the three and a half, so you're already up on me one to nothing. Let's go to the overseas game: the Jaguars and the Bears. The Bears are laying a point and a half to the Jaguars. Yeah, give me. Uh, I I'm toss up on this one. Give me Chicago. I'll take the Jaguars to win this one outright. So I'll want that point and a half. Browns on the road against the Eagles. The Eagles laying nine and a half. Boy, as part of looking at uh, uh, tape for this one, looking at the uh, the some of that Browns tape. Oh my God, they are miserable on offense. Eagle, but Eagles can't. Can't do anything in the secondary, uh, doesn't seem like. Anyway, the Eagles favored by nine and a half in this one. Too big of a line. Eagles win, Browns cover. I'm with you. I think that's a large line for the situation. Give me the Browns plus nine and a half. Commanders go on the road against the Ravens. The Ravens are seven-point home favorites against the rookie quarterback. It's a bigger line than I would think for how well Washington has been. 
Can the Ravens defense get some stops? They've struggled as of late. They've really missed some, some key pieces, some key, uh, key coaches they lost in the offseason. Give me the Ravens. Just have a gut feeling on Baltimore. Yeah, welcome to the NFL. Jaden Daniels game, I think. Uh, Ravens big. I'll lay the seven points. Houston Texans on the road against the Patriots. I'm sure we'll have this one tuned up. Uh, not. Uh, Texans on the road laying six and a half against the Patriots. Drake May's first career start, officially making the quarterback change there. You know what? I'll take the Patriots in this one. I'll take the Texans, lay the six and a half on the road. Cardinals on the road against the Packers. Packers laying five and a half. Eh, give me Green Bay. I'll take Green Bay, lay the five and a half. Buccaneers on the road against the Saints, who don't have a car at quarterback now. Uh, Buccaneers just three and a half point road favorites in this one. This one smells fishy. Yeah, Spencer Rattler can throw the YOLO ball. I wasn't as high on his tape as others coming out, but we'll see what he can do. I'm just going to go Tampa Bay. I'm going to take the Todd Bowles. The defense will make, make some plans for Rattler. I, I'm with you. I'll take Tampa Bay later, three and a half. Colts go on the road against the Titans. Uh, Titans laying three at home against the Colts. No Mason Rudolph should be Will Levis starting. They're not going to make a quarterback change there. I imagine they will at some point later this season. I'll go with the Colts. I'll go with the t- Titans lay the three points at home. Uh, Chargers on the road against the Broncos. Chargers three-point road favorites against the Broncos. Broncos have really good defense. No one talks about that defense, man, but but they are a stout unit across the board. Uh, give me the Chargers. I'll take the Chargers lay the three points. Falcons on the road against the Panthers. Falcons laying six points on the road against Carolina. Go Atlanta. Man, I wish you'd pick some, go to different way here. Uh, Falcons, I'll take the Falcons late to six point. Lions versus the Cowboys. Uh, Lions on the road laying three points against Dallas. A lot of road favorites this week. Um, mm, this one's tough. Give me, I'll go Dallas. Just got feeling at home. I'll take the Lions late to three points on the road. Bengals on the road. I guess that's Sunday night. Uh, laying four against the G-men. Yeah, it's the Bengals. Burrow's in his groove. That defense, I mean, they're not good, but they're going to play better. They're going to get some stops. The Giants are a mess. I don't know if Neighbors is playing this week, but give me the Bengals. Yeah, I think the big thing about the Bengals is at least they can score some points, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I'll take the Bengals late to four points in this one. And then that brings us to the Monday night. Bills at the Jets. Bills are two and a half point road favorites. Man, the Jets really need to win this one too, don't they? Uh, yeah, what a crazy situation that's been. What you think about just quickly on on Robert Sala getting fired? That's I thought surprising. he got the shaft. I think there's more to it. I know Aaron Rodgers said he didn't have his hand in it. Blah blah blah. There's there there's there, there's nothing wrong with that Jets defense. Sala, and that's his calling card. Uh, mm-hmm. Something's going something's going on behind the scenes there. Uh, for you know, it's not like they're oh they were owing oh whatever you know, but so, there's more to the story that might come out eventually. But uh, regardless, the Jets are at home getting two and a half points. Yeah, there's always something going on, going on with the Jets. It's been true since Namath retired. I'll take the uh, I'll take the Jets with the the interim head coach bump that actually is real under Oldbrook. Um, I'll take the Jets. I will as well too. I think they win this outright. That brings us all the way back to the Pittsburgh Steelers at the Las Vegas Raiders. The Steelers are three point road favorites. What say you? Man, Pittsburgh has had some ugly games against the Raiders before, especially out there in Vegas. You know they won. Last year, that was in Vegas, right? That was a, an away game, I believe. Um, I worry about this team running the football, and any time with a quarterback change, a little less familiar. I mean, I think O'Connell, pocket passer, generally plays well, but I just don't. Uh, the Raiders, they can't run the football. Pittsburgh should be able to stop the run. The Raiders' pass game is not threatening in a lot of ways. Bowers is certainly a dude, but beyond that, it's not a lot that scares me. I think Pittsburgh's going to run into a wall a lot in this game, but. Ultimately, I've been wrong with the last three, so this actually may be making Steeler fans nervous, but I'll take Pittsburgh to win 
20 to 16. I have the same exact score written down here. 2016, a rock fight that I think the Steelers, after banging their head up against the wall in a running game, kind of wear them down at the end, like we saw a couple times earlier uh, this season here. So uh, I think maybe they get a key turnover here, get get the field a little bit shortened, come up with a score. Who knows? Maybe even a defensive score uh, mm. in, in this one as well, too. But I have it written down as the same thing. Uh, Steelers cover that three points, 20 to 16 on the road. We're always pretty in sync on our scores, which I know people probably think we like cheat and tell each other the scores before. And because oh. like, we're, we're always within a point or so of each other. But yeah, mm-hmm. 2016 feels like that type of game. All right, uh, we're running a little bit long. We don't have uh, a ton of emails in here overall, so why don't we see what surfaces in and, and circle back to some of these in the email machine uh, on on uh, Monday morning, Alex? Sounds good. Let me let's play our game here really quickly. Let's say the Steelers lose since we both pick, pick Pittsburgh to win. Finish the sentence: The Steelers lost to the Raiders because blank. Uh a defensive score by the Raiders and Brock Bowers having one touchdown. Agreed. I think it'll be implosion by Pittsburgh, a lot of errors and continued inability to run the football would be the recipe to lose this game. I would really like to talk Monday morning about, boy, what do you think they did on, uh, what about, what do you think about what they did about this Raiders deep? We just, we spent all this time talking about first and 10. Normally the things that we highlight sometimes that are so bad the next week, for some reason, you know, we get caught and they say, well, you guys talked about this and it didn't come to, I hope we're, we're talking about that. I like to see this team get better on first down to set up a lot more manageable second and potentially even God forbid, third down, uh, situations. I would like to talk about more, uh, uh, explosive plays down the field, uh, as, as, as well too. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm really going to be looking at throughout the game while I, while, while the game's going on, while I box score, watch the, uh, portion of it is how the Steelers do on first and 10 situations against this Raiders defense. I think it might be a talking mm-hmm. point on Monday. No, it's a great call by you and for Pittsburgh, their third down defense. So bad. The last two games, third and long do not allow third and six plus to, to this Raiders team. I mean, it's, it's been killing Pittsburgh and no one's talking about it, but it, it is hurting this defense in so many dramatic ways. And I think we could potentially talk about George Pickens having a nice game as well, too. Probably not 200 yards. Nice, but you know, uh, five catches, 145 yards and a touchdown, something like that. That'd be nice to see. Sure. Sign me up. I imagine there will, will be an effort to get in the ball early. I think we're going to see a quick screen, a quick slant, something to pick in within the first two plays of this game. All right. Uh, we will be back on Monday then. So uh, shout out to Vinny Bonsignor once again for joining us. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show The Terrible Podcast at gmail.com uh, if you like what we do and want to donate steedersdepot.com hit the donate button also if you like an ad free version of the site steedersdepot.com hit the ad free button follow the directions that way sorry we couldn't get to some emails today just running along here so we'll uh, try to make up for that on Monday uh, as always thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex <laughs>